It has been called the bloodiest domestic insurrection since the Civil War. The Ludlow Massacre was a mass killing on April 20, 1914, when a private militia, hired by the, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, attacked a village of 1,200 striking coal miners and their families. The exact death toll remains unknown, as the victims were so dehumanized in the eyes of their employers, that not so much as a body count was ever conducted. But the year-long labor strike and the ensuing 10-day conflict, known today as the Colorado Coalfield Wars, claimed the lives of at least 200 men, women and children. This is their story. At the dawn of the 20th century, the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company was the largest producer of coal in the western United States. With the newly built railroads, demand for this highly marketable fossil fuel was growing, and there was plenty of it buried just underground. The Rocky Mountains were teeming with veins of coal, but getting to it was a dangerous and labor-intensive process, in the unforgiving wilderness of the Continental Divide. Enter J.D. Rockefeller, the prominent son of a notorious conman, moneylender and actual snake oil salesman, John Davis Rockefeller was widely considered the wealthiest man in modern history. Eager to help with the cash flow problems keeping them from expanding their already profitable mining operations, Rockefeller purchased a controlling share in the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company in 1902. Along with his industrial achievements, Rockefeller is often cited alongside his work as a philanthropist, but his charity was often conditional and used to promote his own political and financial ends. What Rockefeller believed in wasn't so much philanthropy as it was welfare capitalism. In order to mine coal in the undeveloped West, a place with very few towns and little in the way of existing infrastructure, entire settlements had to be erected and populated with workers whose labor was desperately needed in the new mines. These so-called company towns, or planned worker communities, were owned, operated and essentially governed by Colorado Fuel and Iron. In addition to living quarters, these industrial settlements often included schools, churches and company-run stores, where workers would undoubtedly spend most if not all of their wages. Maintenance, repairs, and new constructions were often done by the miners themselves, after their grueling shifts underground and almost never for any additional pay. Around this time, it is estimated that at least 3% of the American population lived in communities like these. Colorado Fuel and Iron, in particular, instituted a company-run social department, in order to better the lives of the workers and their families, while simultaneously influencing their political and economic sentiments. Unions were strictly forbidden, and any books containing erroneous ideas were prohibited. Internal company memos detailed the use of widespread propaganda and covert methods of infiltration intended to sway the opinions not just of their own workforce but that of the larger industrialized world as well. This was accomplished both inside and outside the company-run schoolhouses, where children were indoctrinated as early as kindergarten and taught pro-company rhetoric and the importance of industrial labor, with the expectation that they would someday replace their parents as a more productive and obedient workforce. One such book that was known to be part of a town-wide prohibition was Darwin's famous treatise, On the Origin of Species. The law in these communities was the rule of the company. Curfews were instated. Guards patrolled with machine guns loaded with soft-point bullets. Strangers were not allowed to enter a town nor were residents allowed to leave. One such company guard was reported to have told his residents. I am Jesus Christ, and my men on horses are Jesus Christ, and we must be obeyed. 
Despite the company's claim that everything was done in the best interest of their workers, air pollution was said to be a constant problem, and many of the houses lacked indoor plumbing. And it's not to mention the deplorable conditions of the mines themselves, which claimed the lives of more people than any other profession. Once the problem of financing had been resolved, J.D. Rockefeller gifted control of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company to his son, John Jr., as a birthday present. Just like any good father today might buy their son a car, after making sure it runs properly and is in good working order, old man Rockefeller bought Jr. the largest coal production company in the United States, to test drive and show off to his friends. It should not come as a surprise to anyone what happened next. Things quickly fell apart under the leadership of Rockefeller Jr., who managed the company exclusively from his Manhattan office, far away from the choking clouds of coal dust in mining towns. The only other principal shareholder, at this time, was none other than George Gould, a financier and the oldest son of Jay Gould, the man whose unscrupulous cornering of the gold market, only a few decades earlier, resulted in the infamous Black Friday disaster. Heralded as, the robber baron of the Gilded Age, the full extent of his atrocities deserve a video of their own, but for now we'll continue to examine those of his and Rockefeller's heirs, who both now had a controlling stake in Colorado fuel and iron. A series of deadly explosions from 1904 to 1910, at nearby coal mines, raised questions about public safety all the way in Washington, D.C., and, although they were strictly prohibited by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, unions were formed over concerns for the safety of the workers down in mine shafts. The demands of the United Mine Workers of America were simple, Recognize the union as a legitimate bargaining agent. Compensate workers for additional unpaid work such as clearing forests, laying railroad tracks and hazardous waste disposal. Enforce Colorado's recently enacted labor and safety laws. Allow workers to use boarding houses, stores, schools and doctors outside of the company-run towns. And, end the tyrannical company guard system. The union's demands were met with staunch opposition, and many of the demands were subverted in retaliation. Workload increased and workers were put under strict supervision, as the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company hired additional armed security forces. Reports circulated of a 79-year-old woman, being held for over a month, in a subterranean prison cell, for the sole offense of being pro-union. In September 1913, the United Mine Workers of America were called to strike. Those who answered the call were forced to leave their homes in company-owned towns and join the many makeshift tent colonies growing throughout the Colorado countryside. Tensions escalated quickly on both sides of the picket line, especially when replacement workers and scabs were shipped in from the east to reopen the mines, under the strict supervision of the Colorado National Guard. The treatment of the striking coal miners and their families were hostile to say the least. Armed company guards roamed the outskirts of the tent colonies at night, occasionally firing randomly into their midst like unsupervised children, wanting to provoke a beehive, just to see what would happen. Not willing to sit idly by while their own people were being killed and maimed, the striking coal miners began to take up arms as well intent on defending themselves. Not liking the prospect of being fired upon in return, company militia built a makeshift armored car, using materials obtained at one of Colorado Fuel and Iron's many steel plants. Complete with the side-mounted machine gun, the so-called Death Special was an improvised tank with which they could continue to harass the tent colonies, with little risk to themselves along with long-range assaults using sniper rifles. The striking coal miners and their families were forced to dig pits beneath their tents, in which to take cover from the increasing frequency of gunfire. Things came to a head, in March of 1914, 
when the body of a scab worker turned up on the nearby railroad tracks. The striking coal miners at Ludlow were quickly implicated on little more than a hunch. In what can only be described as an act of insubordinate cruelty, Adjutant General John Chase of the Colorado National Guard ordered the colony to be destroyed. The National Guard set fire to the camp in April of 1914, during a funeral service for two infants who had died in the violence of day before. The armed guards went from tent to tent, dosing the fabric with kerosene and setting fire to them, with or without people still inside. Those who tried to escape the blaze, ran unknowingly into a hailstorm of machine gun fire, and those who remained hidden perished in the flames. The death toll is unknown, but at least 55 women and children were among those who burned to death, as they sheltered in the hand-dug pits under their tents, more frightened of gunshots than of the smoke and fire. Relief efforts, by those carrying the Red Cross flag, were held back by gunfire, for 24 hours after the initial onslaught. In what might have been the only act of mercy for the colonists, the Southern Colorado Railway operators moved their engine deliberately between the tent colony and one of the National Guard's heavy artillery guns, although the second of these weapons still fired on the tents indiscriminately. In what is almost as sickening as the massacre itself, the actions of Adjutant General Chase and the company militia were initially praised as heroic by the Board of Colorado Military Officers, on the sole basis that the coal miners should never have returned fire, if there were still women and children present in the camp. Understandably outraged by the slaughter of so many innocent people, the surviving members of the tent colony, and others, began to vandalize a number of company-owned facilities in the area. In an effort to quickly stamp out these brazen troublemakers, additional detachments of the National Guard were dispatched into the coal fields. It's interesting to note that most of the striking coal miners were actually first-generation Greek immigrants and seasoned veterans of the recent Balkan Wars, the largely successful Western opposition to the now-vanquished Ottoman Empire, the conflict that would eventually escalate into World War I. In much the same way as their confederates back home, the Greek miners of the Colorado coal fields were outnumbered and outgunned by a seemingly indomitable enemy. And, much like their confederates back home, the sheer numbers and inexhaustible resources of their enemy didn't seem to deter them. In a similar vein as the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae or the outnumbered Athenians at the Battle of Marathon, the Greeks of this time and place engaged the combined forces of the company militia and the Colorado National Guard with a do-or-die mentality and all-out guerrilla-style tactics. In what you could call a true David and Goliath story, the Greek coal miners of Ludlow managed to successfully fend off a professionally trained military and continued to wreak havoc on the coal fields of Colorado for 10 straight days. Only when President Woodrow Wilson deployed the United States Army, at the behest of an undoubtedly shocked and shaken Colorado governor, did the conflict come to a decisive end. Few, if any of the dead were given funerary rites, and the bodies of slain strikers lay along the railroad tracks for days, with the company militia refusing to allow them to be buried. Only when the railroad officials complained about the stench, did they allow the bodies to be moved. Besides a few court martials, no reprimandation ever befell those responsible for the massacre. Rockefeller Jr. hired a clever public relations advisor, and, after his first and only trip to his Colorado mining operation, months later, managed to return in even higher public esteem, with a number of carefully staged photographs, of him mingling with some of the miners and their families. I can't help thinking of other so-called philanthropists of our own time, whose charity is far more suspicious than it is beneficial to the typical working class person. The massacre at Ludlow is a stark reminder of the brutality of human nature, but, in an ironic twist of fate, its absence from public consciousness is also a reminder that the kind of propaganda, used by the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, really works, 
as public opinion of organized labor and workers' rights seems to be at an all-time low, especially in an economy increasingly relying on underpaid gig workers, with little benefits or health care. Or even more recently, when the nation's truck drivers and frontline workers, who were praised at the onset of the pandemic as heroes but quickly demonized once they began voicing their own opinions and concerns. The Colorado Coalfield War was a watershed moment in that it helped institute child labor laws, the eight-hour work day and many other regulatory practices across the country. In 1985, Ludlow, Colorado was placed on the National Registry of Historical Places, and a monument was erected at the site of the main encampment. It's easy to view the massacre at Ludlow through a lens of detached curiosity, with the mindset, that was then, and this is now. But personally, I feel the Colorado Coalfield War is still raging in the hearts and minds of many individuals today. And I don't believe it is a struggle of proverbial haves and have-nots, as so many tend to misinterpret the events of history. Rather, it is a war of cultures and ideas. On the one side there is a culture of deception, fraud and control. On the other, a virtues like honesty, justice and freedom. I'd like to end with a quote by Rabbi Ovadia Isiv, from a sermon he delivered in 2010, as I feel it best illustrates this point. Gentiles were born only to serve us. Without that, they have no place in the world. They will work, they will plow, they will reap. We will sit like kings and eat. They balled up their fists and let their fingers point the blame Some would work the docks down by the river Thames Well, they spent all their money on various things Where did all the workmen go? Sure Boy, you're sneaking through the back door 